We believe that Molly is still alive, and if someone has abducted her, we are pleading with you to please release her. Every time I see one of those posters also, you know, it's like, she's gone. In the quiet town of Brooklyn, Iowa, the sun began to set on a seemingly ordinary July evening in 2018. But within hours, the tranquility shattered as a young woman named Molly Tibbetts vanished without a trace. What should have been a simple jog for this vibrant college student transformed into a nationwide search that would grip the hearts of millions. As the days passed, there was no trace of Molly anywhere. When details of her case began to emerge, the cloud of confusion deepened, and everyone asked themselves the same question. What happened to Molly Tibbetts? Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we unraveled the enigmas of both solved and unsolved cases, delving deep into the darkest recesses of humanity's criminal underworld. Our mission is to unravel the mysteries that grip our global community and leave you on the edge of your seat. Join us as we delve into the harrowing facts of this case through painstaking analysis of surveillance footage, examination of suspects, and the meticulous piecing together of evidence. We'll explain every bone-chilling detail that brought Molly's perpetrator to justice, what may have led to her death, and where her body was finally found in the cornfields. Rob and Laura Tibbetts welcomed Molly Cecilia Tibbetts into the world on May 8, 1998, in San Francisco, California. She was the middle child. Her brother Jake was the oldest, and Scott was the youngest. Molly had a pleasant and healthy childhood. She came from a loving, close-knit family, and this had a significant impact on how she matured as a young woman. In 2007, when Molly was in the second grade, she went through a rough patch in her life. Her parents got divorced, which resulted in Molly, her brothers, and mother moving to Brooklyn, Iowa, where they began their new lives. Brooklyn, Iowa is a small town with a population of just 1,400. It is the home of lots and lots of corn. It was also where Molly's mother grew up as a child. And now, in a twisted turn of events, it seemed that Molly would get to experience the same life her mother did as a child. Molly and her brothers found the relocation challenging, not only physically, but also emotionally. Their once happy home, where they used to witness the love between their parents, now felt empty and full of doubt. Although the separation affected the children most, their father maintained a close relationship with his children. He couldn't physically be with them all the time, but he was very much involved in their lives. As the years passed, Molly and her brothers adapted to their new town. It was a different way of life. It was laid back and slow, completely different to their lives back in San Francisco. Molly attended Brooklyn Guernsey Malcolm Jr. Senior High School, where she developed into a highly optimistic and outgoing person. Her close friends described her as a social butterfly and said she was the peacemaker in any situation. Molly was a very positive person and always looked at the good in people. People were drawn to her by her cheerful attitude. This included Dalton Jack, a football player and senior at Molly's school. Molly had her sights set on Dalton, but it wasn't until October 2015 that she and her friends decided to approach him and his group following their football game. Dalton immediately fell for Molly. He felt she was cute and she knew how to make him laugh. They exchanged phone numbers and from then on they enjoyed going on walks and outings to the movies. The two fell in love and were inseparable. Molly stayed committed to Dalton even after moving out of Brooklyn two years later to pursue a physics degree at the University of Iowa. Dalton stayed behind to pursue a profession in construction in hopes of one day starting his own construction company. The distance couldn't keep them apart. They continued to meet on the weekends and occasionally even during the work week if possible. Molly's first year at the university was finished and it was time for her summer break. As May of 2018 drew to a close, she went back to her home in Brooklyn and got a job at the kids' day camp in Grinnell Regional Medical Center. She worked there all summer, and when she had extra time, she would study to prepare for the upcoming school year. Molly loved going on runs just before the sun set. It was a way to stay in shape and witness a stunning view at the same time. Molly switched between spending nights at her mother's house and her boyfriend's house. Dalton, however, was unable to enjoy the summer break like other university students, 
he was required to work during the week and occasionally across the state. Since he worked in the construction industry, it depended on the project. Still, Molly and Dalton were together every second possible. Molly was staying at Dalton's place on July 18, 2018, while he was 130 miles away for work. Molly was studying at his home and had promised to look after his dogs for the time being. Molly stayed inside waiting for the sun to set. And as evening drew closer and the heat died down, Molly got up and decided to go on her regular run. She left the house around 7.30 p.m., sending a picture of herself to Dalton before heading towards the cornfields. Molly never made it home that evening. In fact, Molly was never seen again. Dalton made many attempts to get in touch with her during the night, but was unsuccessful. He didn't give it much thought and figured she was preoccupied studying. However, when he didn't hear anything back the next day, he began to worry. Dalton stated there wasn't a day where Molly didn't text him good morning. He had a feeling in his gut something was wrong. He reached out to a few friends to see if anyone knew where Molly was, but was unsuccessful. He checked her social media accounts to see if she had posted, but all her accounts were silent, and her last online status was from the previous day. The real worry set in when Molly's supervisor called Dalton to ask why Molly hadn't shown up for work. At this point, Dalton knew something was terribly wrong. Molly was always on time and had never missed a day of work. Where was Molly? What could have happened on that summer evening of July 18th? They say that silence speaks the loudest, and this is true because Molly appeared to have vanished into thin air. Her family, friends, and Dalton were frightened something could have happened to her due to this behavior being so out of her character. They just wanted her to come home. Local police were contacted by the end of the day on July 19th, and the entire community of Brooklyn sprang into action to help in the search for Molly. Missing persons posters were circulated throughout the community. The town and its environment were thoroughly searched. Volunteers from all around the country helped in the hunt for Molly, and those who couldn't physically participate in the search still contributed by giving money and raising awareness online. Molly's father rushed down from California to search for his daughter. However, it was very difficult to dig deep because the area was covered in cornfields and Iowa had been experiencing a sweltering summer at the time of Molly's disappearance. Days were passing swiftly, but Molly was still missing. The reward for information leading to her whereabouts rose daily and would eventually reach $400,000. Police in numerous states investigated hundreds of leads in the case over the ensuing weeks, but they were unable to find Molly. Over 2,300 tips were received and over 500 interviews were held throughout the inquiry. Police tried to utilize the Fitbit activity tracker's data to assist them to find her because she was known to constantly wear hers, but this too led to a dead end. It wasn't until mid-August that a major clue to her disappearance was discovered. A neighbor of Dalton's observed something odd from the day Molly vanished when reviewing some earlier camera footage. After giving it to the police, they eventually discovered one lead in the investigation, and this time, suspicion arose quickly. On July 18, 2018, at 7.45 p.m., Molly could be seen jogging down the boundary roadway according to CCTV footage. Not even 20 seconds had passed when a black Chevrolet Malibu with chrome side mirrors, handles, and rims was seen driving in the direction of the jogger. The cops were now quite interested in the car that appeared to be acting strangely. Now, detectives began hunting for the vehicle and the driver. Call it a stroke of luck, or simply the fact that the town was small enough that they quickly located their suspect. The constable was able to locate the car one day after watching the video. The officer located the car on the road and pursued the car, but didn't stop until the driver eventually stopped on his own. When the deputy caught up with the driver, he discovered that the car belonged to John Budd. When the deputy questioned John about the disappearance of Molly, he replied that he had nothing to do with it. As a result, the deputy allowed him to leave. It wasn't until the officers returned to John's workplace two days later that they discovered that he was now driving a new car. The vehicle was discovered to have belonged to his girlfriend. Even though police had no evidence John was involved in Molly's disappearance, the sudden switch of vehicles piqued the curiosity of investigators. Police proceeded and asked John to come by to the police station, 
so they could question him further. John did visit the police station, and following many hours of interrogation, he cracked and had a confession to make. He confessed that his name was not really John Budd. He identified himself as Christian Bahina Riviera. At the time of questioning, he was 24 years old. He lived and worked in the rural area of Palshik County, just outside of Brooklyn. He was an illegal immigrant who came to the United States at the age of 17 and had been living there illegally ever since. He was originally from El Guayabillo, Guerrero, Mexico. Although he wasn't allowed to legally work in the U.S., he found a way to cheat the system. Before joining Yerabi Farms in August 2014, he had worked at several other farms. When Christian and the cops were at ease with one another, they asked him about Molly once more. And this time, John admitted to having seen her the evening she disappeared. He admitted he walked up to Molly and began running beside her before engaging in conversation. The first try didn't go so well, so he tried again, but she refused and threatened to call the cops if he didn't leave her alone. After being questioned for 10 hours the following day, on August 21st, Christian Bahina Riviera agreed to take the police to a place outside of Brooklyn. Hidden away in a rural remote area shrouded by eerie silence, the police descended from their vehicles ready to embark on their harrowing quest. As they ventured forth, determined to find the elusive truth, the turbulent gusts taunted the tall corn stalks, revealing an ominous clearing that revealed itself like a malevolent grin. They pressed onwards, their steps laced with trepidation, and then, amidst the suffocating stillness, their senses were stabbed by a sight that froze their blood and sent shivers down their spines. Under a covering of cornstalks, Molly Tibbetts' lifeless body was lying in front of them. She was partially clothed, only wearing a sports bra and socks. Given how long it had been out there, her body was severely decomposed. Christian confessed to authorities that when he approached her and when she threatened to call the cops, he panicked and killed her, and then hid her body in the cornfield. Molly had 7 to 12 stab wounds in her chest, ribs, neck, and head. She died as a result of these severe force wounds. The news of Molly's untimely demise hit everyone, touching the depths of their souls. Her friends, family, and relatives were left heartbroken. In the quiet corners of the neighborhood, where whispers traveled swiftly, the truth about Christian, an illegal immigrant, was known to all. And in this revelation, a storm of anger and indignation brewed within the hearts of the community. This anger found itself into the political spotlight. The president at the time blamed her death on the actions of an illegal immigrant from Mexico. When they found out that it was this horrible, illegal immigrant that viciously killed her, all of a sudden that story went down. They didn't want to cover it the way it should have been covered. Christian was charged with first-degree murder on August 22, 2018. When the prosecutor flagged him as a flight risk, the judge increased his bond from $1 million to $5 million. He entered a not guilty plea on September 19th. Christian's black Chevrolet was being closely examined by forensic investigators. The analysis revealed that blood was discovered in the bottom and on the rim of the car. It was confirmed that Molly was in his trunk that evening when the forensic experts compared Molly's DNA with that of the sample found in the car. The trial was pushed back several months and moved to another county due to safety concerns and the publicity of the trial. Christian Riviera's defense team submitted a 29-page motion in August 2019 seeking that his interrogation not be allowed as evidence since he had not been read his Miranda rights at the time. Due to this, his confession to the crime could not be used against him in court despite admitting to the murder. Finally, on May 17, 2021, the long-awaited trial began. Christian's defense team contended in court that the detectives had breached his rights before charging him with murder. Additionally, they claimed that the police used unethical methods to coerce Christian into linking himself to the crime. When these tricks didn't work, they accused Dalton, Molly's boyfriend, of killing her. They claimed he had cheated on her three years prior and had motives for the crime. Dalton's colleagues confirmed his location, ruling him out as a suspect. Dalton was two hours away when the murder happened, making it impossible to even consider him a suspect. When Christian Riviera finally stood up to give his testimony, he told a story that sounded completely made up. 
he stated that two armed men had come to his house and forced him to drive them around the neighborhood until they found Molly. The men then killed her, then forced him to drive to a cornfield and threatened him with his daughter's life if he revealed to anyone what had happened. Christian found himself trapped in a hopeless situation, as the concocted tale he had fabricated crumbled before him. His uncooperative confession, leading police to Molly's body, the CCTV footage, and Molly's blood in his trunk didn't help him either. On May 28, 2021, Christian was found guilty and convicted for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. Christian was left silent and expressionless as the verdict was reached. Christian was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is currently detained at the Iowa State Penitentiary, ISP, in Fort Madison, Iowa, and will complete his life sentence in the maximum security facility. Following the political twist that Molly's case never meant to attract, colleagues of Christian Riviera, innocent bystanders, became the scapegoats of an unjust and cruel backlash. Harassed and viciously driven out of their beloved Brooklyn ranch, they had no choice but to leave everything behind, including their vulnerable 17-year-old son, Ulysses Felix, stranded in a desolate and heart-wrenching predicament. Ulysses was left adrift, devoid of any familial support or a place he could call home. It seemed as if the world had collapsed around him, suffocating him with despair. Meanwhile, Molly's mother, Laura, her heart shattered by the loss of her daughter, found solace in wonderment about what her beloved Molly would have done if she were still alive. In a courageous and compassion-filled act, Laura, Molly's mother, chose to follow the path her daughter might have taken. Overwhelmed by an indescribable ache, she opened her arms and her home to Ulysses. In that moment, she became his beacon of hope, his steadfast guardian amidst the storm. Laura's decision to adopt Ulysses bestowed upon him a lifeline, a chance to continue his education to forge a path towards a brighter future. Though the weight of sorrow still bore heavily upon his young shoulders, he now had the unwavering support of a mother figure who believed in him. The tragic loss of Molly Tibbetts has left a lasting impact on those who knew her, as well as a wider community. As the details of her murder unfolded, shocking the nation, it became clear that the world had lost a bright and kind-hearted soul. The grief felt by her loved ones cut deeply into their hearts as they struggled to comprehend the senseless act that took her away from them. The heartache and emptiness that now filled their lives serve as a constant reminder of the precious life that was taken too soon. Among the darkness, Molly's family chose love over hate. Molly's legacy continues to inspire and ignite change the placing of her initials on her brother's football team shirts moved the hearts of many, as they saw firsthand the impact she had on those around her. The creation of the hashtag Miles for Molly movement sent shockwaves through the running community, forcing them to confront the very real dangers faced by women while pursuing their passion. Through the power of social media, the Molly movement blooms, spreading a message of love, kindness, and the urgent need for a world without violence. The world feels an overwhelming sense of duty to uphold Molly's spirit, making sure her memory lives on.